All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Divina. Thank you so much for joining us today at the Media Club. And on behalf of the Media Education Lab, I welcome you. Just a few quick announcements before we begin. Like I mentioned, we are recording this Zoom meeting for our archives. So please turn off your microphones and video so that there's no lag in the meeting. Um, you can enable the closed captions option by just scrolling down to your Zoom activity controls. Um, I think Francia or Jocelyn can help you in chat in case you have any questions about that. Um, like already announced, please use the chat to introduce yourselves in which part of the world you're coming from. We will also use the chat to share resources as we progress through the session. So please share relevant information and links in chat. We would love to have those resources all in one place. I will be compiling all of them uh, and sharing them in the form of a Google Doc. Um, link will be in chat in a minute. Um, please save the link so you can access the Google Doc later. I'll be introducing our topic and hosts for today in a second. We've planned a very exciting session for you. There are also a few exciting announcements coming for you towards the end of the meeting, so stay tuned. So today we're discussing a podcast from the Ezra Klein Show. It's called A Skeptical Take on the AI Revolution. I'll also add a link to that in chat. Um, if you've had a chance to listen to the episode, that's great. Please let us know your thoughts about the podcast episode in chat as well. If you didn't have a chance to listen to the episode, please don't worry. Our amazing hosts have included a short summary in their slides. They'll also keep coming back to podcast snippets to deepen our conversation. Um, and they're really, really amazing. They've planned a super media club session for us today. Um, kindly take a note of their fantastic achievements and passions and interests. So uh, to begin with, our first host is Christina Cordero, PhD. Um, she's a researcher and product developer in the edtech space. Christina, say hi. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. She hi. She currently teaches in the Modern Languages Department at Brooklyn College, City University of New York. Uh, Christina conducts research on reading, writing, libraries, and technology, and works as a consultant on editorial and technology projects. She's interested in all the ways digital technologies may support literacy learning in both the traditional sense and in the more contemporary sense of new literacies, digital literacies, multimodality, and the multiliteracies pedagogical framework. Hey, welcome. Uh, Christina Moda, PhD, has a background in artificial intelligence with a research focus on NLP, natural language processing, for over 25 years. Hi, Christina. Say hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, she's interested in machine learning, information extraction, web development, corpus creation and annotation, and lexicon grammar framework. Uh, Christina is currently a research associate at INSDID, working on paraphrasing systems. She's also the co founder and CEO of Kinderbots.org, a non profit on teaching children computer science and robotics. And I would really love to know more about that if we have the time. Uh, Kate Dalton has been a regular at the Media Club. She's joined us for sessions. She's hosted sessions and beautiful sessions, I may, if I may say so. Uh, she's the founder and the co-founder and CEO of Mark Tracker. She's an English teacher turned EdTech founder and Mark Tracker is a fabulous platform for critical media literacy curriculum, instruction and assessment. Kate currently serves as a writing assessment consultant within the New York City Department of Education's Office for Teaching and Learning. And she's passionate about the intersection of language, technology, and education. Say hi, Kate. Hello, thank you. <laughs> Our hosts have worked really hard over the last few weeks to bring you a fantastic session today. Over to you, hosts. So let's get started, Kate. <laughs> Yeah, great. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Thank you guys for getting going in the chat, Chris and Scott, with that free version of New York Times, um, the podcast. Uh, Christine, if you go to our next slide for us, we're going to ground our discussion today in critical media literacy. We're actually going to have a two part. Uh, I don't know if we said that, but this will be the first part of um, our sessions. We'll go over a little background on AI and um, AI in education or tech in education leading to breakouts. So we really want to make sure we have time for that for your discussion. 
Um, and this notion of critical media literacy, um, really, if I could direct your attention to the part at the end about like analyzing and creating media for students and also to interrogate the relationship between power and knowledge. And so really a lot of critical media literacy is looking at this relationship between technology, language, meaning, and power. So um, we'll obviously have a lot to talk about with ChatGPT today. So um, next slide. Great, oh yeah. So we're gonna right. icebreaker with Christina. Okay, so the first thing that I, we wanted to do to kind of take the temperature of, of you guys and you know the different feelings that you all have is we want you to look at these five images and ask you which picture, they're numbered, uh, one, two, three, four, five, which picture best depicts your current feeling towards chat GPT, generative AI, and all of the you know talk that has brought us here together today. So just to give you a refresh, and I, um, at number one, we have Edvard Munch, the scream representing like the utter anxiety that many of us feel. Number two, we have a, a little depiction of Andy Warhol's repetitive um, prints of, in this case, Liz Taylor, an artist who's one of the most memorable artists of the 20th century, who proved that reproductions can be an art form and valued as originals. Then we have Rodin's The Thinker, which from the turn of the 20th century, he is philosophically thinking about all this. Are you one of those people? Uh, four is Baccioni, a Baccioni that's in the um, Museum of Modern Art in New York. And he is this futurist who's like moving forward, but pulled back at the same time, like wanting to move forward and pulling back. And then the last picture is Christina the World, um, Andrew Wyeth's painting of a disabled woman who is in the grass who didn't want to use a wheelchair. And so she's kind of, trying to reach towards, towards something that feels unattainable. So who are you in this? Hang on to your thoughts, because we're going to get back to it. And it could be interesting for us to talk about in um, the breakout rooms and a little bit further towards the end. Because I think that, the, I guess the sense that we have is that everybody's coming at this from a different, maybe from a different angle. And so we want to just um, respect all of those attitudes about um, what these new technologies mean for us. A lot of number three I'm seeing, um, and also a lot, a lot of us people that are like, I'm five and one, right? Or I'm one and three. So, you know, maybe depending on the day. <laughs> I'm um, kind of four, and I will explain why later. Um, even though I actually kind of represented by all these, all of these pictures. And, and, you know, we kind of wanted to use art too as a way of thinking. I mean, what what artists and creative people have to, to contribute to this conversation in addition to, to, to technologists and education people. So, you know, the, the nature of this talk was really to come together so that all of these inter, you know, multiple disciplines can come together and, and think together about these issues, which are really important. Um, I think, are we ready for the next slide? Yeah, we can go to the next one. Um, great point about, yeah. So I was interested in showing this technology adoption curve mainly because I'm kind of an accidental technologist. I'm from the literature world and I was never interested in technology and I dislike adopting new technology, but I ended up in a PhD with a crazy computer scientist who made me think hard about these things. And I also have kids and I care about knowing, you know, how they do things and what they do. And one of the most interesting um, graphs that I ever saw was this. And the best way to explain it is, imagine you have just like, you are sick of your old cell phone and you can't deal with it. You're, you have a flip phone and you need to get a smartphone. You are starting at the corner of this X, Y axis. And that's the technology trigger. Like you need to get something new. And you, you, know, you research the market, you're super jazzed about this new smartphone and you get it. And suddenly you realize like, so you've got all these inflated expectations that the media has come, all the advertisements have told you whatever mark, grit brand you're buying, like you made your decision and you're buying it and you've, or you've got to buy into it. And there's all these expectations. But then once you actually buy the phone, suddenly you realize like, I have to learn how to use this freaking thing. And maybe I know how to work it, maybe I don't. And so very often with new technologies, especially with people who are not like tech or gadget people like myself, you reach a point that, is called the trough of disillusionment. And by the way, this was invented by this group called Gartner who are kind of consultants, usability people in the technology space. Um, and a lot of people leave when they get the trough of disillusionment, just say, I can't deal with this. I'm just gonna go back because I can't, I can't deal. 
that, but the people that stick around will eventually re reach what they call the slope of enlightenment, which is slower than the, the curve going up to the peak of inflated expectations. And slowly but surely you start adopting it and reaching a, eventually what they call the plateau of productivity, which actually it looks flat, but it doesn't. It goes up little by little. So I guess the question we wanted to ask was, where do you think you are on this chart with respect to generative AI and chat GPT? And... Do you think that this chart is even relevant in the sense that the difference between buying a new phone is that the phone exists? And, you know, as we were talking about it, we were thinking that chat GPT is also something that's changing all the time. So does this still apply? Um, so keep that in your head as we think about coming together and talking. I think we can go to the next slide. And Christina is gonna go into a little bit of like the backdrop against which ChatGPT emerged. Um, so ChatGPT, that's why we're here today, uh, because it's a system that became popular because it was launched in 2020, but it became popular in November with the version 3.0. It's a large language model. Uh, it's powered by a large language model and it belongs to a, a larger category of gener generative AI. And what is that? It basically means it creates new content. Uh, since November, so in just two months, uh, it's it set a record to as the fastest growing user base uh, with 100 million users, which is really, really amazing. Um, and why is that? It's because it engages in a conversation that sounds plausible and human. Is it because it can create both text and uh, coding? Uh, so why, why are we here today talking? It was a big, big boom uh, in artificial intelligence. So some, just some words before we go to the timeline to keep in mind. It's of course artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning. It, it's been popular for more years than artificial intelligence, uh, which is just one of the fields of artificial intelligence. Uh, but you, you need to keep in mind also hallucinations. Uh, you might have bumped into many uh, people talking about AI, uh, them talking about AI hallucinations. Uh, and of course, deep learning is the, the base of the large language models uh, and also prompt engineering, because without prompt engineering, you cannot uh, use uh, ChatGPT in a good way because it really depends. Uh, it's the prompt that uh, it's going to... Um, uh, prompt <laughs> for a better word, uh, a, a completion of whatever you're trying to ask from ChatGPT. Um, in terms of historical context, as I said, I uh, studied AI in the 90s. It was uh, already during the winter of AI. So that's a, a period of time from the 70s to the 90s where there was no funding for AI. Uh, there was only a boom in the in the middle of that period, which was the expert systems. It's a base rule system uh, developed uh, through experts. Uh, and what I wanted to point out here is that over the years, uh, the Enigma machine was one of the first, but uh, per the Perceptron, for instance, uh, in that was released in uh, uh, or published in the 60s, in the beginning of the 60s, uh, it's actually the birth of the deep learning because that was the first neural network. It's just a neuron that is able to classify uh, between, um, it's a binary classification. It distinguishes between two groups. Uh, and over these years, uh, only in the, especially in the beginning of 2000s, that's when uh, machine learning and deep learning started to take off because the devices, uh, the technology allowed for that for uh, uh, billions of uh, parameters to be processed with the very fast computers. Uh, and that's how we got to ChatGPT. ChatGPT, for many of you who follow the discussions, they, it's not a big jump in terms of innovation because the, the, um, um, the technology behind was already invented. But it was ChatGPT that brought that up to the big public. And I think this is a good moment to go to the next slide because everyone now, I would never imagine after 30 years, everyone would be talking about AI. And this would be, although we have been using AI for a long time, we don't even sometimes uh, perceive that, uh, but uh, that's your take, Kate. <laughs> oh, 
Yeah, so right. And I'm seeing some comments in the chat about like the concerns about the implications and what's happening. And so, you know, it's important to keep in mind that these are um, part of a legacy, a history of things that are ongoing. And there are other ways to use technology than the ways that we are maybe experiencing them now and some of the costs. But before um, we get into some of more of the implications at the end, we're going to talk about, um, we're going to take a look at this Oliver clip, just a quick, his, I don't know if you guys saw this episode, he devoted a whole 45 minute segment to this. Um, so we're just showing you his little brief overview and just keep in mind, what, what are we noticing about kind of, what does this clip say about the general conversation around AI and anything else you notice about his presentation? But again, it's just really short. Already everywhere, but already everywhere but right now people are freaking out a bit about it and part of that has to do with the fact that these new programs are generative they are creating images or writing text which is unnerving because those are things that we've traditionally considered human but it is worth knowing there is a major threshold that ai hasn't crossed yet and to understand it helps to know that there are two basic categories of ai there is narrow ai which can perform only one narrowly defined task or small set of related tasks like these programs. And then there is general AI, which means systems that demonstrate intelligent behavior across a range of cognitive tasks. General AI would look more like the kind of highly versatile technology that you see featured in movies like Jarvis in Iron Man or the program that made Joaquin Phoenix fall in love with his phone in her. All the AI currently in use is narrow. General AI is something that some scientists think is unlikely to occur for a decade or longer, with others questioning whether it will happen at all. So just know that right now, even if an AI insists to you that it wants to be alive, it is just generating text. It is not self-aware yet. But it's all... I think we can stop here, right, Kate? Sure, yeah, that's great. Um, so any... Right. How is generative AI different from AI? We have that question coming in. Uh, do you want me to jump in or should we like that for later? No, go ahead and jump in on that. Um, okay, Christina, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. But is it possible to use earphones or headphones? There's a little bit of reverb. Yes. Some more on this. The belt. Okay, yeah. Sorry. And he does mention general AI and generative AI. So that is, um, and Christine, we're going to need you to pull up the presentation again, I think. Um, so those are two different things. So chat GPT is generative, but it's what he's saying is that it's not general. So um, that would be something different that we're not quite there at. Um, yeah. Right. Um, hi, I think I'm not sure if it's me having technical issues, but I couldn't hear you, Kate. Is it good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I can what was the question again? Oh, sorry. What was uh, the question again? How is generative AI different from other forms of AI? Okay. So AI is a very broad field of computer science that tries to create uh, either robots or programs that display certain human behavior. We already have that, like for instance, in uh, Google, Gmail, when you type something, it suggests what to, to, to uh, uh, write next, or when you receive a, um, even your spam filter uh, is based in uh, AI techniques. Uh, the thing, the biggest difference is that it, it, it's able to process much more information. Now, generative AI, what it does is produces new content. Uh, for instance, the machine learning is used to optimize. Or for instance, when you think of a robot, he moves, he's able to move to tense the environment and make decisions by, based on that environment. And one of the biggest um, features of AI is that he's able to do machine learning. From a few examples or a million of examples, it can learn new things. So generative AI is just about producing a result with the AI techniques. So it produces content new content that uh, now it's arguable if it's been done before, as you can, uh, and that's why sometimes it produces hallucination. Uh, but uh, in terms of, uh, for instance, ChatGPT, you, you give a prompt in natural language, which is already a big thing. 
uh, and then it generates content in natural language processing. But for instance, for Dolly, you have a prompt in natural language processing, and it produces an image based on the content on the on the on the sentence that you you gave to the system. So generative is just about creating new content where uh, you have other kinds of AI where you make decisions like the robot, depending on the sensors and the environment, it makes decisions moving right or left, stopping, just like a, a, a self-drive car. So yeah, uh, and that, that point about uh, new content. Yeah, so that is great. I think I'm getting some, um, yes, exactly, Pam. I was just going to say, if we could go to the next slide about new content, about what exactly is new, right? So um, I think for the purpose of our conversation up to this point, we're saying new is like appears new, right? Appears as if it's original writing, um, you know, how truly creative or new is that? Um, is a big question, uh, both technical and philosophical in a way. <laughs> um, so, which does bring us to where we are to, with the skeptical take on the AI revolution, which is the podcast that we had had um, for this conversation to center on. Like we said, we have the link there. Um, and so I'm just gonna go over a couple of the key concepts um, that are, I give you a preview. If you get a chance, you can check it out. Gary Marcus was on the show um, January 6th, which is not that long ago, but I guess in chat GPT timeline, it is, you know, a lot of developments have happened <laughs> since then. Um, so Gary Marcus was uh, on that letter last week um, among the people signing to propose the halt. So um, you may have caught that in the news, but he's talking about the nature of truth and language, um, you should, we should note that he is a psychologist. So, you know, the linguists and humanity scholars among us might have had some bones uh, to pick with him <laughs> at times. I know I did. Um, I, you know, I was like, Wittgenstein would like a word, but, you know, so that's <laughs> the philosophy, uh, the philosopher of language. Um, but he talks about misinformation at scale, which has a lot of implications um, for us. It is like a continuation of what we've already seen with misinformation or what we know about like the fire hose of false content. Um, he's just saying that it can be a lot more sophisticated at this point because um, what could do what bots could produce before they can, you know, produce it, you know, at almost infinite scale. Um, he's talking about the quality of information, the price of um, bullshit he talks about a lot being reduced to nearly zero. Um, he also gets into the business model and incentives in AI. Um, and so that's an important thing to consider, especially from a critical media literacy lens. Um, and who are the people behind these tools? What are their incentives? What are their motives? Um, those are the types of questions that we can ask with our students on repeat um, when we consider you know, these tools, even if as we're adopting them, if we choose to do that. Um, and he also gets into the AI approaches, which is interesting. Again, we're gonna get, have a part two, so we're gonna dig in more there, but um, we're gonna show you the, um, the we wanna also note that these are familiar critiques within the AI world um, and that these prominent AI researchers, technologists, and ethicists, um, Emily Bender, Timnit Gabru, Margaret Mitchell, and Angelina McMillan Major wrote something in 2021 on the dangers of stochastic parrots. Um, so, you know, um, Gary Marcus echoes a lot of their concerns about, you know, what the language is and the nature of it actually being new. We can see that um, in the stochastic parrot concept on the um, right of your screen. But also on the left, um, he doesn't quite get into some of these other things. And, you know, it's things that we know about data centers and their carbon footprint. They're not necessarily um, carbon neutral. So for producing large amounts of data, we're collecting it. Um, that can have a real impact on the environment. Um, and so also the other things about the language that um, we're scraping. So for instance, ChatGPT scrapes a lot of things from web content. Um, and so it scrapes a lot from Reddit. 67% of Reddit users are men <laughs> between the ages of like 18 and 29. So I'm um, this, this cited in this paper, but like, so we can tell that, you know, what is out there or the world's languages. 90% um, of the world's languages, over 1 billion people is what they speak, um, was not reflected in ChatGPT. That data was not necessarily scraped. So, you know, in terms of what we're reproducing, what we're valuing in terms of data, whose um, interests we're serving, you know, there's a really big question around that for large language models, which applies to a lot of technologies, but also specifically ChatGPT and BARD and the like. So let me go to the next slide. Oh, I also had this question, how do we address this in the classroom? So um, we have some links to resources, but you know, 
feel free to um, jump in on the chat or unmute yourself at this point if you have ways that you address data ethics in the classroom or you know algorithmic literacy. We see anything in the chat coming in, Christina and Christina? I think there was a question from Davina to Christina Mota. She wanted to know what you had to say about that. Uh, I, I didn't hear Christina. Oh, she asked, uh, Davina wanted to know what you had to say about maybe the stochastic parrot piece or the data. No, it was, it was actually in response to a question by Jeffrey Perone, uh, who asks, has anyone asked chat GPD to write a better version of itself yet? We seem to be close to featuring on the verge of the intelligence explosion, where an AI writes a better version of itself that repeats, etc. Uh, Davina, I cannot hear very well. I don't know. I'm. I think it might be my connection. Sure. I'll just copy paste the question and chat again. Okay. Thank you. And then we'll um, yeah. Um. So in. Um, normally, as I said in the in the beginning, uh, one of the biggest features for artificial intelligence is uh, machine learning, which means that from uh, experience they learn new things and they they're able to generalize and uh, uh, and get better and better. So uh, I didn't do that question yet to ChatGPT four. I didn't have the time yet to explore ChatGPT four. Uh, but I'm definitely interested in, uh, in I, I did some experience with my own research work because it's the one that I know the best and I can really critique better. Uh, and I was a little bit disappointed. So I'm, I'm curious to do the same tests again with a new version. I don't know if that answer, answers your question. It does, Wait, so it does. I just share a link in chat to answer your question, Kate, when you ask. How can we address these concerns in and out of the classroom? There's this neat resource I found. It's called Day of AI, and it literally has levels um, of classes where they're asking different questions um, and how we can tackle those questions in the classroom according to the different grades students are in. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and just keep those resources. I know you guys on the call have resources and ideas too, so keep them coming. Um in the presentation and we'll have some at the end for you as well. We're going to um we want to make sure that we're at we want to make sure we have time for our breakout rooms. So we're going to go to Christina Cordero who's going to set us up nicely by talking about creativity and some of the idea relate which relates to some of the ideas coming up in the chat. So thank you. Yeah, you know it's funny that Christina was just asked this question about the machines and in the chat we're all talking about like can AI teach AI and somebody made it this funny George Carlin joke you can look in the chat um which is you know kind of just like the machines rolling around themselves but I want to kind of bring it back to the teaching because I think most of us are in the classroom with real people and real students to with whom we have some sort of responsibility and desire to shape and help think about this as well. Um, and the thing that I've been thinking about a lot is this question of, you know, humans and machines, what are humans good at and what are machines good at? And I will preface this by saying that I teach two classes. I teach a literature class and I teach a translation class. And in my translation class, because I used to be a literary translator, and this um, AI has been used for a long time in translation. You can open Microsoft Word and translate something. And so in that context, we talk in my class a lot about, you know, to what extent is a Microsoft Word translator useful for translating? And, and, and we think about the decisions that we want to make. And I, and just to give you an example, a lot of us have come to the conclusion, because we do, we, I open every class with a song, and sometimes we laugh out loud at the way um, the machines have translated songs. And so, however, when you have a 500 page document from UNESCO, the, the machine translation is actually incredibly helpful and your role is different as a translator. But then when you think about literature, this poses, you know, a, a very, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm looking like Rodin's thinker because it really makes me think. And 
that's what these two quotes are about. So Gary Marcus in the podcast said, you know, I'm not saying that AI has to be like a human. I think humans are pretty flawed. And I actually don't think he really meant to be so critical of human beings. But what he says is, I think there's a potential to empower every individual sort of in the way that DALI does. And DALI is a generative AI site that works um, with images kind of the way ChatGPT does with words. And But you could also think about it in terms of like Canva now helps us all become graphic designers. And you know the big question that I want to pose up to us and what I'm interested in talking about in the breakout room is, you know, what where's the line that we draw between with, with ourselves and our students in terms of how, um, to what extent ChatGPT or a tool like ChatGPT can be a help in the classroom and not take over the things that somebody in the chat mentioned, you know, like that the technology taking over us, like how can we make decisions so that we uh, own the technology and the technology doesn't own us. And with respect to, you know, literacy and creativity, Nick Cave on his website and in the New Yorker had a lot to say about this that really is just, it's, you know, the emotional side of the writer. And he says, you know, look, this is what humble humans can offer that AI can only mimic. And basically he talks about, you know, the journey of the artist who writes because he or she or they gain something from the experience and the sweat of writing. And if you have not seen William Faulkner's um, Nobel Prize speech, like he says it so eloquently in the speech that like his life was dedicated to that. And his wife was not dedicated to like producing a text. It was dedicated to exploring, you know, the nuances of human suffering and, and joy and all that. So, you know, what Cave says is he's just disappointed that there are a lot of people that kind of gloss over that aspect of creativity, you know, not just in the sense of like the, the desperate artist, like a suffering artist, but for everybody who, you know, for whom maybe it is worth spending time suffering a little bit with what writing involves. So I think we should take it to the next one. Again, so the question, the big question is what, how does this relate to your teaching practice? You know, like if you're a teacher in the classroom or you're a librarian and you're mediating, you know, how, what side of the, of the spectrum do you find yourself on in this? And, and what issues does the, do these quotes raise for you? Great. Um, yeah, so we're going to get ready for the breakout um, for our, you know, this is called a skeptical take on AI revolution. So we're going to talk about our own skepticism, optimism, and, and what's next. Um, so we're going to, we have some quotes that we're going to drop into the chat. We're also going to do like a little splash on the next slide for you of like, here are some salient quotes that are meaty and relate to the podcast um, core ideas. And then you're going to discuss as group these three questions um, about optimism, skepticism, and then that last one about how we address it in media literacy and other educational contexts. Um, so along the lines of what you guys are already starting in the chat, but you're going to continue that um, IRL, well, sort of, in a Zoom chat room um, with each other. Um, so that would be great. And I think Davina is going to set us up. And um, here we have the quotes to go here. Just here's our quote splash. Give you a little and if you look in the chat, yeah. uh, we've got the transcript of the podcast and then these PDF quotes. And Kate, I should share the presentations. Does that make sense? The, the, oh, sure. The, yes. Everyone has the, the directions, um, the slide link. That would be great. Um, but the, yeah. the thing is, you yeah. might have to actually reshare these things in your own breakout rooms because once yeah, yeah, you yeah. start breakouts, all this chat will go away. Um, also, what I'm doing is I am allowing people to choose their breakout rooms. Um, I've named breakout rooms by the host names and I'm opening all the rooms. Is it okay if I open them for 10 minutes? 10 minutes sounds good. Hosts? Kate, Christina, Christina? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. So I'm going to open them. They're open now. Participants, you can choose. And then if there are people who are left in the main room, I'll just assign them. So if you want to choose your host, choose them now. Or I put you where I put you. Um, so the thing that may, may I share maybe? Well, it was a great conversation with my group. We, of course, got cut off and, you know, didn't cover everything we wanted to, but um, 
lots of passionate thoughts and different takes and interesting questions. So more questions were raised, which is always something I guess you want to see like from your presentation and your students. So. Um. Yeah, I mean, in our group, we, we talked about a bunch of different things that I've put on our slide presentation, but I want everybody to know we are doing another session. And I think that what would be great is for us to pull down the salient things that came out of this, um, what we are going to do is to pull out the salient things that came out of this. I mean, in our group, we talked about the fear of chat GPT being used without teacher mediation and obviously like the misinformation that kids, students are gonna be able to access. Another person raised a, a concern about the just the conversations around the technologies and the black box and the fact that people who aren't so steeped in this can be duped. But we also had kind of a positive take on it um, in which someone reminded us, well, I think that the technologies themselves are not like inherently bad and that they may help us to rethink ourselves and our own humankind and our relationship to communities. And that maybe we ought to be asking about why people want to shut it down. And, you know, the, and that brings in the whole question of, you know, civics and, and corporations. So, and then finally, somebody said something about it being about not about the technology, but about the people, which I will say that my PhD advisor, who is like a computer guy, always said that to me. So I think we have so many topics that we're gonna be able to break into for the next session. Christina, maybe you could tell us. And Scott, I'm putting down what you're putting in the chat. Um, so in our room, uh, they were, the first voice was actually very optimistical, uh, seeing ChatGPT and these sort of technologies as a, a way of having a personal assistant. But in the end, the final decision, it's always up to us, just a little bit like in machine translation, because uh, we want at this, we, it's kind of the idea that we want perpet to per perpetuate uh, ourselves. Uh, but we also need to be open to the new technologies and understand them and understand how we can use them. Uh, but of course, the, the majority of the voices were a little bit skeptical and worried and concerned. One of the concerns was about, again, uh, driving the cost of bullshit to, to zero, not to ship, sorry. Um, uh, especially in the current context, uh, con uh, context. Uh, where we see democracy being shaken a little bit with so much information, uh, and especially misinformation. But at the same time, there was a positive look on this concern, which was that media literacy could actually help um, uh, people use technology in a better way and distinguish uh, a right from wrong and truth, truth from falsehood. Uh, another, another concern was um, uh, 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 how uh, AI or does AI know what it, what's doing, what is it doing, or does it, doesn't, doesn't it know what it's uh, actually doing? So it, this is a big concern because right now it actually doesn't know because there's not a framework of the, the real world uh, that's not in the system. It's just massive amounts of data, but none about the... Uh, like uh, so we have these discussions among us, like uh, the notion of what the family is, what the world works. So it doesn't have a representation of that. Uh, and of course, uh, how can we know that an answer is reliable? Uh, and then, uh, and also the sources, well, what kind of sources are being used? So this is a problem about transparency. Uh, and the, another concern was about um, that, uh, students and adults need to have control over checking the sources and the internet is being produced. Uh, so these were very interesting points in our, in our group. Uh, we didn't go to the practical Great. side, so how we can do <laughs> and use, but uh, I think these are the concerns and the optimist, uh, optimism first. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Christina, do you have someone in your group that was that is going to share out for us, you think? Yeah, Scott, you got cut off. And I think that Scott, why don't you introduce yourself? I think you have, you're like kind of in the corner of two areas that could be very interesting. You know, if you would share a little bit what you wanted to share with our group. And then if oh, there's sure. time, it would be great if you could say something too. Okay, thanks. Um, my name is Scott Moss. I'm a technology coordinator at the Los Angeles County Office of Ed. I'm also a, a doctoral candidate at UCLA. And um, I'm doing my dissertation is uh, a case study on what uh, some call critical algorithmic literacy, which is kind of a, a combination of computer science and media lit. And as I kind of wrote in the chat, um, you know, computer, if you look at computer science education, either, you know, you're kind of a computer science student or you're not. You take those electives in high school and you 
continue on that path. And most people don't take any, don't have any computer science in their education at all. But if we add computer science to the multi-literacies that we think about with media literacies, then just as, you know, in a media literacy class, you might learn about lighting and music and whatever, kind of some basic production to, so you can analyze things uh, better. A little computer science uh, might support learners as we live in this AI world. So hopefully that was a, a good summary there. Yeah, I also was going to say, Wolf, you had mentioned something that hadn't, we didn't touch on that much, but that relates to something that Kate was talking about, you know, that you were talking about um, rethinking, you, rethinking humanity a little bit and communities and corporations and their influence. Are you still there, Wolf? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, just um, saying that, you know, that's more uh, from from an uh, post humanist point of view uh, see what we can do. we are all techniques i mean humankind and techniques is the same thing humankind it, it doesn't exist without techniques you know and without technologies so we are techniques so uh, this new technique or technology i think uh, it shows us something about us about humankind about humans uh, this technology shows us, reflects, uh, it, 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 it offers some reflections, new reflections on us as, uh, as uh, cinema did it and telephone and, uh, and print media, you know, we changed with the techniques. We are changing as humankind with techniques and technologies. So we can just uh, look at it and what is AI technologies telling us about us? Uh, so we can just uh, take uh, uh, take this as an opportunity also. But as I said in the group, uh, uh, the, 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 all the technologies are uh, um, taken by uh, big companies and corporations uh, that are orienting, uh, giving them... Uh, um, Others, other kind of spaces of, of uh, uses, uh, they're, they're maybe not uh, what we need, you know. Uh, this is a kind of uh, argument Gary Marcus also presents, I think, as yeah. I understood him. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's a wonderful note for us. Christina, um, if you could share the last slide, please, um, for us to close on. And um, that idea, and it, it comes up a lot, that this overall conversation is a mirror to, to our society and who we are. Um, and I think as educators, um, we want to be part of um, shaping what that future is of these technologies um, as well. So that's our sort of challenge moving forward. And as we look to the next session, where we're going to get, get more into working groups and action steps, both about in the classroom, maybe policy level, for ways that we want to um, adopt, reject, change, shape um, these uh, technologies in the future. So thank you so much. We want to um, stay in touch and also um, make sure you sign up for this um, webinar, May 1st, Monday, May 1st, and the webinar series um, from URI coming up on these fantastic topics. We heard prompt engineering today, rhetoric near and dear to my heart, um, media literacy through the AI hype, which should touch upon a lot of this, um, and artificial intelligence literacy, obviously super Thank relevant. you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Christina, for nice presentations. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Davina, what, any, can I hand, I'm going to kick it back to you. Yes. Thank you yes. so much for having us. Yes, of course. What a wonderful session this was. And this is not the only session that we're going to be doing with you. We are seeing you again next Monday, uh, the first Monday of May. That's going to be for lack of a better phrasing right now, part two of what we just did, because I can see there are a lot of comments, there are a lot of questions, the chat is still going on with. I have a request from the host, for the hosts, please add these resources, uh, the, the last slide of, of resources that you just showed us, Dr. Moda, in uh, the Google Doc that I shared, yes, these please resources. Please you want to see Oh yeah, or better still, if we could just have these slides as one of the resources in the Google Doc that I've been sharing in, in chat, where I've been compiling all the resources. That is one. And uh, I remember that I promised you some exciting announcements, but those announcements have already been made. So thank you. You've helped me doing my job. 
Um, if you enjoyed this session, you will certainly love what um, our hosts, Kate, Christine, and Christina, have planned for you. So please return for another session uh, in May, and we'll build on our conversation today and workshop ideas further that are relevant for us in our classrooms and research. And um, I've already shared the link. Um, we are launching the AI in the Classroom webinar series in April. Um, you can see that in the PPT here as well. Frank is looking at ChatGPT, helpful or harmful for teaching rhetoric. Michelle is going to be speaking about can media literacy uh, help us see through the AI hype. Uh, Pamela, who is here with us today. Hi, Pam. Uh, she's going to be talking on AI literacy. And Kathy and Dana are going to be talking about teaching prompt engineering in classrooms. Um, I've already shared the link in chat. I'll put it there again. I hope you can join us and please share about this in your networks. Uh, we're still finalizing the June webinar series um, for the AI in the classroom um, topic uh, and the June media clubs. If you want to host a media, the media club starting June, please get in touch with us and we'll be happy to discuss a book, journal article, opinion editorial piece, podcast, video, movie, platform, game, app, any other media artifact related to media literacy and media education. This is all the time we have for you today. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to end with the link to the AI in the Classroom webinar series in chat. And once again, in case you missed it, the Media Club resources Google Doc. Thank you so much, everyone. Quickly copy these links so that you don't lose them and the resources. And I will see you in the AI webinar series starting in April. And then with our hosts for today, once again, on the 1st of May, Monday. See ya. Thanks so and much. Enjoy the sunshine.